Hi, everybody. It's Bob Phillips with Common Cause North Carolina, again talking with two lawmakers who serve in the North Carolina General Assembly and will soon be going back to work, at least in Raleigh. They are always working. There's no doubt about that. But in, in terms of coming back for session on April 28th, and let me have them introduce themselves. Uh, Representative Fisher, why don't you go first? Okay, um, I'm Representative Susan Fisher, and I represent District 114, which is a third of Buncombe County. Um, the western uh, portion, along with some of the northern portion of the county. Um, and I'm, I've been at this for now eight terms, running for a ninth. Very good. Representative Fraley. Thank you, Bob. And uh, Susan, it's nice to be with you both this afternoon. Uh, I'm in my third term uh, in the House. Uh, I represent uh, District 95, which is Southern Iredell County. So basically from Statesville down to the Mecklenburg County line. Uh, in the House, I uh, am co-chair on education appropriations and education policy for universities and on all kinds of other committees, but uh, large focus on education, which has been a passion of mine since I uh, ran for office. I think that's what I think that's what you'll find we have in common, John and I, and it is really uh, refreshing to have a colleague in the house that you can um, go to um, to talk about issues of importance and especially during this uh, pandemic. Well, let me ask you all a little bit about that. I think that's one thing people like, regardless of whatever political uh, persuasion one is, uh, I think people like to see people work across the aisles and you all do that and have done that. How did you all get this connection and relationship uh, that you have? <laughs> well, I was just gonna, I was just reminded when he, when he was talking, when John was talking about uh, being from Iredell, I have relatives in Statesville, Iredell County from way back. And I think we had a discussion about that maybe a little bit at the very beginning of, of uh, John's time in the legislature. But the other thing that is just so <laughs> fun about uh, our sort of back and forth is that we, uh, we kid each other about when it's time to cast a vote in, on the House floor we will try to confuse each other about whether it should be red or green. And it's all in good fun, but it is also, um, you know, a reminder to both of us that we are there uh, representing all kinds of people, all kinds of places. And I don't know, we, we just hit it off, right, John? I think we did. Yeah, I have, absolutely. I, I remember so fondly in my second term, uh, Susan and I sat right across the aisle <laughs> from each other. And uh, like- They actually separated us, I think. I think they we, separated us on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we sit across the main aisle from each other. But uh, my second term was just a regular aisle. And uh, between uh, some of the other colleagues that were around us, and we were in an area where there were Republicans and Democrats together, uh, we had a, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, all, you know, talked back and forth seriously about different things and, you know, uh, different philosophies, different votes, identical votes, whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a good relationship. And I think, you know, you see a lot in the newspapers and everything about uh, how partisan everything is, but there's a very, very large sort of core group, I think, in the, in the House that, you know, thinks the same way. They want to accomplish the same goals. They just have a little different way or time schedule of getting there. And uh, I found that, you know, in my relationship that Susan and I have is, you know, there's not too much that we have difference of uh, opinions on, uh, particularly on some, the education thing that's a uh, big passion for both of us. 
That's, uh, that's great to hear. And I know that, you know, differences are fine too. That's part of the world we live in and having civil conversations to talk those things out and find out where there is compromise. And I guess to kind of get into that, how have you all found having this relationship benefits uh, when you're talking public policy and maybe even where you have issues that you do disagree with, but you can have those civil conversations and, and maybe find a middle ground. How has it been helpful uh, in that you've had this kind of um, relationship? You know, I, Bob, I've always felt like that if you can't pick up the phone or go see somebody and say, what were you thinking about? Or tell me why you're thinking this way. Uh, you lose in, in the long run. And I think that, you know, Susan and I have had a relationship like that. And we've both had those relationships with a lot of other people, you know, in the house, uh, across parties and also within parties. So uh, it's just, it's very important to uh, keep an open mind and listen to what people ha have to say. I, I found any number of issues that my thinking in the end has been different than what I thought initially. And, and that's, that's really a good point. I think, and, and you don't get to that unless you are listening and John listens. I sort of, I work on listening and because I think it's so important that people feel they've been heard. So there's the listening thing. And then there's also the trust. I think that you, you know, you go into, relationships and you you wonder okay so can i trust that what this person is telling me is really what they think or is this just you know party line or what is this and i think that it, uh, it mutually um that john and i know that what we say is not being sort of dictated by our leadership necessarily but that, and that we can trust each other in conversation. So I, I hope that, you know, I hope, I think that's kind of what I've sensed over the, the years that we've known each other. But, you know, I, those are the two important things, especially in this time of partisan back and forth, is, is being able to listen and figure out another way, possibly, from having listened, and then trust being able to trust who you're speaking with. And I feel like those two things exist uh, with, where John and I are concerned. You know, Bob, uh, also, if you just think about the uh, COVID uh, working group that we have now on education, which Susan and I are both on, I know you uh, spoke to my co-chairs, Representative Clements and Representative Horn, earlier in the week, but uh, after we had our committee meeting, not yesterday, but the one before, yeah. uh, we're on the phone with uh, Susan and uh, Representative Brian Turner and the three chairs following up on, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I think what, it was Greg, Greg Meyer, possibly. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Instead sorry. of Brian, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but we had that conversation, you know, trying to make sure that we're getting everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you the broad number of things through conversations like that. And then Representative Clemens has gone back and had discussions with her caucus. We've had discussions with ours. Then Ashton and Craig and I get back together and say, well, that's a better idea, you know. So uh, it's wor it's working out uh, very very well, and quite frankly, it needs to work like that more often. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I agree. That's great to hear. As your colleague uh, Representative Horn said, you know, it's kind of a COVID nineteen moment, maybe mm -hmm. kind of sad, and and I think you all embody that kind of uh, spirit as well. Certainly, he and Representative Clemens shared that with us. One thing we're worried about, obviously, is just when you folks come back to town and wanting to make sure that indeed when you do the people's business, you're also mindful of protecting yourselves and your own health. Um, I know some of these things are still being worked out and um, Representative Fraley, maybe you know, and Representative Fisher too, you as well, 
Uh, what is it going to look like when you all come back on April 28th for this very unusual but very important session? We actually just uh, finished up a caucus call and had some discussion about that. And I can honestly tell you it's still uh, very fluid. Uh, there are a number of things who are trying to figure out uh, could you vote by uh, proxy? You know, for example, if you are uncomfortable in being there, uh, you could tell uh, Representative Darren Jackson on the Democratic side or Representative John Bell on the Republican side, please cast my vote, you know, for me. Now, there are lots of things that have to uh, be understood and controlled about that. But it's, it's still very fluid as to how that's all going to work out. Um, but I think the focus is on uh, whatever it is, it's going to be in and out very quickly and with as few people there as possible. That, that certainly uh, makes sense. And Representative Fisher, I don't know if you wanted to uh, well, anything to that or not. I was just going to say that at this point, um, I had um, told Leader Jackson that I really would prefer the idea of being able to give him my proxy. Because, for example, I have an 88-year-old mom that I look after when I'm here in, in Asheville. And, um, I don't want to risk uh, bringing back anything that would harm her or, or me for that matter and the rest of my family. So, you know, and I, I was saying that unless we have that stay at home order lifted, um, it kind of, I, I, it gives me pause anyway. I would hesitate um, about coming down, but I, I haven't ruled it out altogether. And that's why I was very interested to hear what John was saying because um, and it sounds similar to what our caucus has been saying too about uh, being fluid and I'm, I'm still sort of staying tuned to see what the final um, prescription is for our session on the 28th. I think well, too, Bob, that uh, on the four COVID committees, mm -hmm. uh, everybody is really working very hard to make sure that it's a uh, total bipartisan bill that's going to be filed and uh, from what I'm hearing back and forth from all of the chairs uh, the bills seem to be being drafted that way I mean in the education area uh, we've basically gone through everything at this point with the exception of still needing to deal with school calendar and a couple nutrition things which are big difficult issues but everything else and I think Susan would agree with this we've gone through and gone over and really have not had any really perceptible pushback you know on anything from from either side so I think trying to keep everybody involved uh, will also help uh, when we do come back on the 28th to be quick and get to people's business done. Right. Very, I agree. very good. I know this is not an issue that will come up necessarily in the beginning. And from what I understand, which is still a fluid situation, you know, maybe this will be a series of sessions where you're in, you take a pause, you come back and that kind of thing. And certainly these COVID-19 response legislation at the beginning, so important. And then the budget, of course, is looming out there and the revenue shortfall. But one thing, too, that I know will be on you all's plate, though I know both of you are not on that committee, but will be election in November and what it might look like. And I don't know whether you all have thoughts about that. And in your areas, uh, the, the comfort people may have about uh, not voting in person, potentially. And even though, as a state, there is no way we can uh, handle a very, you know, big vote by mail, you know, you don't make that leap overnight. So we certainly hope that in-person voting is viable. At least I know uh, Common Cause is, is counting on that. But then again, we just don't know. But to the extent that you all might be picking up on conversations or thinking about election changes down the road, which will come, I guess, um, 
just curious on what your thoughts are about that. Well, I, I think it's going to be a combination of things, Bob. Um, we don't want to have a Wisconsin. I think that was really um, so um, hard to have asked everybody to go out and vote under the circumstances that we're in today. We, we hear that uh, COVID-19 is probably not a seasonal flu, that it would probably, it, it, it could happen any, at any point during the year. Um, but I think the things that, the main things we have to look at for election time are building our, our capacity for absentee voting in North Carolina. We, um, and that has a whole lot to do with um, our ability to count votes again and uh, to do that in a way that is uh, that has plenty of integrity and then the the next thing we have to do is we have to um, I think allow the full amount of time for early voting because if we if we have an early voting situation leading up to the November elections where it is spaced out far enough we won't have the crowds, the push of people at each location uh, risking uh, COVID infection. And we'll be, we'd be able to keep it you know, sanitized and do the appropriate social distancing and all of that. But I think um, the idea of uh, stepping up our ability in North Carolina to, to do absentee making sure we have plenty of time for early voting. And um, I mean, I, I really see those as two of the main things we need to be looking at uh, going in. I think uh, also that obviously this is gonna be a very important election. A lot of people want to vote, uh, both parties, independent parties, uh, you know, the whole gamut. Uh, I know there's a tremendous amount of conversation that's going back and forth with the state board of, okay, what are the options? What do we have to be prepared for? Much like we're having a conversation in the education committee and with the state board right now of if you, we go back to school in the fall and have to practice social distancing, how, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to prepare for those things now. So I, I think that there's clearly a lot of discussion and planning uh, going on. I don't know that everybody's on the same page yet, but I think the ultimate goal is to figure out a way that as many people that want to vote are able to vote. And that, that's ultimately what it was all about and to do it uh, in a safe manner. And, Ultimately, I think all of that will get worked out. I certainly agree, and I hope so. Um, two other quick questions, and I would be remiss, <laughs> knowing you all know who I am, not to at least mention that word redistricting. You all have been very kind to put your names on redistricting reform bills, and I'm not about to ask you how to solve it, because it is something that is, if we knew exactly how to solve it, we would be, you know, I would be very rich right mm -hmm. now, I guess. But I guess I want to ask you, is this a session, you know, sometime during the summer for this issue to come up? Or is it, I mean, it may be even impossible for you all to answer that. I know Chuck McGrady, when we talked with him, he said, oh, I was hoping, you know, in a normal session in April, we might have even had a, a hearing on this issue. Uh, and I don't even know whether that would have happened, but I know he had that hope. Um, is it something you think that needs to be considered sometime before you all do finally, you know, adjourn this short session? You know, Bob, I think I would probably be on the same page as Chuck that uh, I think whatever we do in the summer is going to be so focused on budget and very important and people are going to be uh, wanting to get in and out. Uh, my guess is that it goes into next year. And uh, I'll be watching what Susan does on that <laughs> because I'm not running again. <laughs> and I am sorry about that. <laughs> so that I, you know, like you said, uh, every term I've been in the house, I have uh, been a proponent 
of uh, having uh, districts drawn independently, done different ways than what we're doing and people being able to uh, vote. Uh, and I just don't think though that uh, there's going to be the time or the impetus to take care of that this year. Well, if that doesn't happen, we will still need your voice down the road, whether you're in you know, whatever capacity you are doing in 2021 for sure. The last question is what I really should have asked you all at the very beginning, and that is simply, how are you doing? Uh, Representative Fisher, you go first. I'm doing fine. Uh, like we said in the beginning, it has been almost as busy as with all of the Zooming we've been doing lately. But um, health-wise, I'm, I'm great, and my family is good. Um, I've been really keeping tabs on my son in Japan. Um, they've had school closed. They, they are, their school year goes from April to April, and they've had school closings since uh, the beginning of March. But wow. they opened them briefly, and then their numbers went up, mm. and they closed them again. So it's, um, it's a funny time, but everybody's healthy. Thank you for asking. That's great to hear. Representative Fraley? Same here that uh, we've been just absolutely slammed with work. Uh, I do this full time. And uh, so it's a full time job before this ever started. And uh, it's been much more so since then. But uh, fortunately, uh, all of my family's healthy. We don't have any family or any friends that we're aware of anywhere in the world that have been infected. So we feel very fortunate about that. And we just keep our fingers crossed that that continues to be the case. But thank you very much for asking. Well, indeed, I'm, I'm happy to hear that both of you and your families are doing well. And certainly more than ever, uh, you know, thank you both for your service to the state of North Carolina and to your constituents. Uh, I know because I'm a lobbyist, you know, you all are in full-time jobs and beyond. And I wish more people in your own areas and around the state knows that, knew that. I mean, I know you all probably have folks come up and say, well, how are things going in Washington, D.C.? Thinking you all are there. <laughs> and we're thinking you all are making big, big money. And we know that's not the case. But okay. thank you for the sacrifices you all are making, and particularly in this time. And uh, I wish you both the best. And I do look forward to when I can in person see you both and perhaps lobby you actually uh, <laughs> in person. Um, and I look forward to that. But uh, take care and keep you know doing what you're doing, serving uh, the people. I know it's refreshing to know that you two are there uh, with the broad interest of our state. So thank you again so much. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Susan. It's always a pleasure. And same to you, John Fraley. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.